Good morning, everyone. I am Michael Hussey. I'm the Dean at Widener Law Commonwealth. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the first session of our fifth annual Veteran Services Program. The law school and Widener University have a long tradition of serving veterans dating back to the university's time as the Pennsylvania Military College. At the law school, we have a veterans initiative to support our veteran law students. The initiative provides support to each veteran for that veteran's academic, career, and financial needs tailored to that veteran's unique experience so that each may become a successful attorney. Thank you to Professor Christian Johnson, Joy Boudreau, Corinna Wilson, Brian Fernball, Paula Hyder, the AOPC, and everyone else involved for all of their hard work in conceiving and coordinating this program. I hope you find today's session informative. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Michael. Um, we're going to begin our program with a message from Justice Todd of the, of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. She has been extraordinarily supportive of, of our efforts here at the law school and in particular of veterans across Pennsylvania. And so we, we look forward to her message. After we finish that message, we'll turn the time over to uh, Corinna Wilson, who will be the moderator for our panel today. Good morning. It is my privilege to welcome you to Widener University Commonwealth Law School's fifth annual Veterans Services Program. Thank you, Professor, former Dean, Christian Johnson, for once again extending an invitation to me to greet your online attendees. Thanks also to Dean Michael Hussey and the Law School administration and faculty for your dedication and continued support of our veterans. I would like to acknowledge Angela Lowry and Andy Simpson from the Administrative Office of Pennsylvania Courts for their assistance in coordinating this program. I would also like to acknowledge all of the distinguished panelists participating in the program. Michael Carrington, Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, Richard Pajeski, Pennsylvania Board of Probation and Parole, Joanne Tresco, Sergeant Major, retired, Pennsylvania Army National Guard, Earl Granville, retired Staff Sergeant, Army National Guard, Maureen Weigel, Brigadier General, Pennsylvania, Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. Jeanette Krolzik, Pennsylvania Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, and Governor's Advisory Council for Veterans Affairs. Finally, thanks to all of you for your continued support of justice for veterans. I bring you greetings from Chief Justice Baer and all of my colleagues on the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. It is my honor to continue to serve as the Supreme Court's liaison to Pennsylvania's Veterans Courts. While I am not a veteran, I am married to retired U.S. Army Colonel Steve Todd, and we share a deep commitment to our Pennsylvania Veterans Court program. I'm proud of my husband's 29 years of military service, six and a half years of which were on active duty, and which included activation during Operation Desert Storm. Steve presently serves as the mentor coordinator in Butler County Veterans Court. As Americans, we owe a debt of gratitude to our military veterans. And our Supreme Court is committed to doing everything we can to support the men and women who have served our country as they transition back to civilian life. As you all know, Many veterans struggle with the readjustment to civilian life. Pennsylvania has the fourth highest population of veterans in this country, nearly 800,000, and their struggles affect all of our communities. It is estimated that 17 to 20% of our young vets suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, or major depression yet only half of these vets seek treatment. Others resort to self-medication with drugs and alcohol, which often leads to their involvement with the criminal justice system. 
It has been estimated that one third of America's homeless are veterans. On any given night, over 23,000 veterans are unsheltered or living on the streets. The majority of those suffer from substance abuse, mental illness, or related disorders. Veterans who are homeless have a higher prevalence of criminal justice system involvement. About half of all veterans experiencing homelessness who have participated in the VA Homeless Assistance Program are involved in the justice system. Sadly, an average of 18 veterans commit suicide every day in the United States. Pennsylvania's Veterans Treatment Courts provide access to justice for veterans in our Commonwealth. Building on the problem-solving court model, eligible veteran defendants with substance dependency and or mental illness are placed on a specialized criminal docket. These courts combine treatment and personal accountability with the goal of breaking the cycle of addiction and criminal behavior. After initial screening and assessment, these veterans are offered an opportunity to participate in this voluntary program. It involves ju judicially supervised compliance with a treatment plan developed by veteran health care professionals. Compliance is monitored through regularly scheduled court hearings, during which participants may be sanctioned for non-compliance and rewarded for a job well done. Similar to the protocol in drug treatment courts, veteran participants progress through the program by moving through phases. Veterans courts emphasize a team-focused approach through collaboration and cooperation among judges, treatment providers, and veteran volunteer mentors. At graduation, successful participants have become stable, employed, and substance-free and continue to receive mental health care through community and peer counseling groups or the VA. We currently have 25 veterans courts in Pennsylvania. Two other courts, Luzerne and Wyoming Sullivan counties, provide a veterans track in their adult drug and or DUI courts. Nearly 2,000 veterans have completed the rigorous one and a half to two year program and have graduated from Pennsylvania Veterans Courts. Successful Veterans Courts boast impressively low recidivism rates and save countless tax dollars by keeping our veterans out of prison. Veteran Courts provide access to justice for Pennsylvania veterans and they truly help our veterans find their way back home. Dean Hussey, best wishes for a successful program. And to all of our veterans tuning in today, I thank you for your service. My name is Corinna Wilson, and I am the moderator of today's panel. And uh, I am honored always to be on the same program with Justice Todd and thank her very much for her remarks this morning. Thanks to Dean Hussey for having me. And thanks to Professor Johnson also for his invitation to serve as your moderator today. Uh, I will introduce our two panelists in a moment. Um, the way this is going to run this morning just for housekeeping is each panelist is going to get five to 10 minutes to talk about his work. Uh, and then we will open it up for questions. I have a million questions myself, but I will um, happily ask yours if you put them in the chat. We'll get to those um, after uh, Michael and Richard have a chance to, to tell you a little bit about their work. As Justice Todd said, uh, and in the past in this program, in the past four years, we've focused quite a bit on the veterans courts in Pennsylvania, the innovative courts um, that are so impactful and so effective. Uh, this morning's panel, we will be focusing on what happens to those veterans who end up incarcerated in the state prison system and what happens to them then in their post-incarceration uh, life. And so we have two experts with us this morning and I'll briefly introduce them. Uh, Michael Carrington, as we say, is our inside expert. He is the expert on what happens during their incarceration. He is the statewide veterans coordinator for the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. 
and has been in this position since late 2020. Um, both of our guests this morning are, are former Marines, so we know they bring with them the passion uh, that their service will, will, will provide to them. Uh, Michael was honorably discharged in the rank of sergeant, and uh, that very same year, 2006, graduated from uh, Park University uh, with a BS in criminal justice, started his career with Commonwealth shortly thereafter, uh, went to the Pennsylvania Board of Probation and Parole as an institutional parole agent, um, and was promoted there and, uh, and, and as a parole supervisor until his recent appointment to the, the position he holds now. In addition to his job, Michael has many other professional commitments, which include uh, operations manager for the Middle Atlantic States Correctional Association, vice president for the Community Corrections Association of Pennsylvania, a trainer for the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections and Board of Probation and Parole Leadership Development course, and a certified trauma-informed care trainer, uh, which is another thing I know he'll be talking about this morning. Richard uh, Paduski is the chief of the reentry treatment programs in the Bureau of Treatment Services at the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. Uh, as I said, Richard's also a Marine, graduated from the DeSales with a bachelor's in criminal justice and has a master's in public administration from Kutztown. Uh, he started his uh, career in corrections at the Bucks County Department of Corrections, worked there for 13 years. And then um, before coming over to corrections was at the Board of par uh, Pardon and Parole, Probation and Parole, uh, beginning in 2000, served in a number of jobs there, most recently as Director of Bureau of Offender Reentry Coordination. He also is active in many community service organizations, including the American Probation and Parole Association, the National Association of Probation Executives, the American Legion, and the Marine Corps League Lehigh Valley Detachment. He also has many uh, community service commitments, both very busy, accomplished guests uh, that we have this morning. So I'll turn it first to Michael for an overview of you know, what he's doing, what he observes, what he sees as the big issues facing uh, veterans in the corrections system. And I'll mute myself until Michael's done, and then we'll turn it over to Richard. Michael. All right, thank you for that introduction, Corinna. Uh, for those who see sweat pouring out of my uh, brow, it's it's not because of the lights of this big stage. It's uh, been hit with Lyme disease here lately, so it's been quite a task to kind of overcome. So if I forget anything, I can blame it on the Limes. The fact that my name is messed up, the wrong Zoom account, I blame it on Limes. But I'm really happy to be here, and uh, I'm honored to be on this panel uh, for such a great cause. First and foremost, you know, thank you to any of the veterans that are on here today for your service. Um, we really appreciate the comments by Justice Todd and, and, and what everybody is tuning in for and what the panelists are doing here today. I, I heard several of the names. I didn't know they were all panelists, but I know that they're people that I work with regularly and, and it's such a great team that we have under the Governor's Advisory Council moving ahead. Um, as Corinna said, I'm not gonna get into my background at all. She kind of highlighted that, but what I will say is I, I went to a uh, Marine Corps boot camp on September 16, 2001. Uh, so short, you know, several days after the 9-11 attacks. I had been in the delayed entry program for about 10 months. So I wasn't one of the ones who can claim that, hey, because of the attacks I went in, but I went in shortly following uh, those attacks. Now we were the first Marine Corps boot camp to, uh, to get together uh, following 9-11. And it certainly was, uh, was a crazy time in the country. Going through that boot camp, I'd say it was the best experience of my military career. Um, and now that I'm in corrections, you know, 20 years later, as the statewide veterans coordinator, I really look back on that boot camp experience and can say I took away two things that are going to be really effective with helping incarcerated veterans. Uh, first and foremost was that before you even knew all the names of the people in your platoon, you were already fighting for each other. Uh, the company was broken into seven platoons. The platoons at Marine Corps boot camp uh, basically compete against each other in all kinds of exercises during the three months that you're down there. Uh, you become a brotherhood immediately and you fight for your brother without knowing their name, without knowing their background, without knowing their story. So that's first and foremost. And we'll get into that a little bit here in a few minutes. Secondly is the military, regardless of your branch, trained you to be able to be okay on your own. Uh, never give up. Uh, you can do anything, you know, an army of one. Uh, and, and so these are two key points when we talk about veterans and how we help veterans moving forward that I really focus on uh, when I go around and meet with veterans within the state population. 
Uh, I'll touch on that stuff in a minute, but just to give you a brief overview. So when an inmate comes out and gets sentenced to a state prison sentence and ultimately winds up in a state correctional institute, they go to classification, depending if they're male or female, will depend which classification institution that they go to. Uh, that's where our first hiccup is right now that we're working on is how do I identify a veteran coming into the system? Uh, we don't have any fail-proof system. We're working on a new classification tool that should identify them at classification and be able to get them to a place where they can immediately get some veteran-related services. But right now, it's hit and miss. So once they get into classification, ultimately, a lot of times they're not identified until they're going to come up for parole that first time and an institutional parole agent ask them if they've ever served. They indicate yes or no, and then that goes into a report that uh, anybody within corrections can see, but oftentimes it's way too late to be able to provide them services. We run a search selection tool through the uh, VA that we input names, socials, and try and get a master list of all of our incarcerated vets. We do that quarterly, and our last quarterly report reported about 2,700 incarcerated veterans. We know there's many more than that, um, but you know that takes us to the 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 you know, you can do anything on your own mentality. A lot of veterans do not want to report their military service because either they're ashamed that they're now incarcerated after uh, serving their country, um, that, you know, they failed either themselves or their families because they're in a situation that they put themselves in because they weren't quote unquote strong enough to manage uh, maybe their depression, their anxiety, their PTSD, TBI uh, outside on their own. And so what we're trying to do statewide is really advocate and create a community where they feel safe and secure to say, listen, I am a veteran and I'm proud of my service and I can be proud of my service and still admit that I have things that I need to work on and that I can't do everything on my own. And then I can get into one of these statewide programs that's gonna give me the specific benefits and resources and services and programs that are made for somebody like me who's been through what I've been through or something similar to that. Um, so first is better advocacy statewide in a better uh, program that shows that there is going to be safety and there is going to be uh, detailed and personal assistance that they can count on if they get into one of our veteran service units. We have five veteran service units right now statewide. Uh, we have a few, in, at least one in each region, uh, one in uh, SCI Dallas, SCI Phoenix, SCI Houtsdale, SCI Mercer, and our female uh, VSU, which was the first female veteran service unit nationally, is at SCI Muncie. Um, these veteran service units basically try and pull veterans from statewide institutions that meet general criteria, positive behavior, uh, positive compliance to programming, and put them into a unit surrounded by like peers. And within the st state correctional institutions, what we have found is we have so many specialized units uh, where we are getting people that have similar uh, not per se issues, but backgrounds or similar criteria that we can put them into a unit together where they can feel safe, where they can identify, where they can form bonds with like people that have similar issues or that are facing similar circumstances. And what we see is all of a sudden those defenses goes down, the walls go down, the us versus you mentality goes down, bonds begin forming, they start to monitor each other, they start to communicate with each other, they start to care about each other, and ultimately there's some positive adjustment that takes place. And uh, one institution specifically that I can reference is kind of our lead veteran service union, SCI Houtsdale, with 170 plus veterans on there. That unit hasn't issued a single misconduct to an inmate uh, since 2016. Uh, now, a unit going a whole day without issuing a misconduct is a big deal within the DOC, let alone several years with that many inmates. And it's because they have built a program that is the foundation is based upon Inmates helping inmates, peer to peer, inmate leadership, veteran inmate leadership, leading veteran inmates with staff who care about the population and provide adequate and effective facilitation of programs, workshops, meaningful trainings, meaningful resources. And that leads into that second boot camp point. When you get people that feel comfortable together, that feel like they're part of a group, that feel like they're part of a team that's working toward a mission they naturally gravitate up or gravitate down. In this case, you put these military veterans together on a unit and they gravitate up, they pull each other up. They want to do well for each other. They don't wanna be the one that slows you down. At boot camp, you didn't wanna be the guy that was messing up the marching on the drill field because your whole platoon was gonna pay if you messed up. 
Well, that's kind of the same mentality you can draw off of that. Yes, mistakes were made. Yes, these, these men and women are serving state sentences for crimes that they committed. No, we mustn't ever forget about the victims of the crimes and we must keep them at the forefront. But the best way that we can help prevent victimization moving forward and the best way that we can help the community moving forward is to get these veterans together, give them the adequate programs, education and services that they need, allow them to form those camaraderie or get the camaraderie and form those common bonds within the unit and push each other to be the best that they can be while the staff who oversee what is going on basically provides support, facilitates. Yes, they need to step in from time to time, but ultimately this is an inmate driven and inmate led program and it needs to be that way because that's how it's most effective. Um, with that, I think I'm just about where my time should be. So I'll wrap it up there, but certainly open to any questions moving forward. And I really appreciate the time today. Thank you, Michael. And we'll turn the floor over to Richard. And Richard, you need to unmute. Well, hello. Uh, my name is Rich Pajeski, and uh, um, I just want to I just want to preface it by um, I was in the artillery when I was in the Marine Corps. So sometimes I have a little a little hearing issue when I can't when I can't hear. But uh, I, I'd like to thank Miss Wilson and uh, Miss Lowry and uh, Andy Simpson for thinking enough of me to to invite me here to talk about some of the initiatives that that I've been doing working with the AOPC and to talk a little bit about some of the things that that while I was uh, with the parole board still that we were able to accomplish uh, in the VSUs. Uh, so uh, I am I am indeed privileged uh, and uh, to uh, be able to speak with you all today. I I, I think I'd I'd like to talk about a couple things. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what, what Mike had mentioned um, about, about veterans and sort of that, that attitude that veterans have um, amongst, amongst one another. And one of the things that I took from boot camp uh, back in 1981, which is a really long time ago, um, 40 years uh, since I stood on those yellow footprints on Paris Island. Um, uh, but uh, it's it's really it's really about that esprit de corps, and especially with uh, the Marine Corps, and I know the other branches feel it as well. Um, you you are indoctrinated with such a pride uh, in not only not only your 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 particular branch of service, but you're, you're also a, a, a indoctrinated with that with that feeling of belonging. Uh, when you join a military organization. And it's really felt, um, uh, especially I can speak directly to how it's felt um, in the uh, Marine Corps environment. Um, there, there isn't a Marine that, that uh, it, it doesn't matter if, if I know the Marine or not. Um, when I say Semper Fi, uh, he, he, he knows how to respond to that or she knows how to respond to that. It's generally, it's generally an hoorah uh, because uh, um, that is something that that defines us when, when you go to Paris Island and, and graduate uh, with that Marine Corps uh, emblem of the Eagle Globe and Anchor, you are, you are part of that, oh, you're part of that brotherhood. And um, um, uh, I, I, I can certainly attest to that. And I, I know Mike can as well. And, and, and any Marine that I've ever met, uh, whether I know him or not, whether I see him in a store or, or whether I see a, a, a truck and I'm taking my, and I'm taking my lumber back, back to my truck at the Lowe's, uh, I see a Marine, it's, it's always, it's always simplified brother. And, uh, you, you know, that's, that's that common bond. And one of the things that, that I think Mike alluded to, which I, I would certainly reinforce is uh, not, not only the, some of the trouble we have with identifying veterans, but uh, some of the trouble uh, we have having veterans understand that, that their service was indeed important and, and it was indeed meaningful. Um, I remember uh, back when I started, uh, there was a real issue with identifying uh, veterans because we simply didn't know how to ask that question. Um, uh, you know, did you ever serve? Are you a veteran? Did you ever wear your country's uniform? Uh, there, there, there are ways to ask that question. Uh, one of the things that, that I like to do when I visit the veteran services units is, uh, is, I try to, is I try to recapture that esprit de corps 
um, that um, I, I, I just spoke about. And, and one, of the, one of the tools that I use is I'll uh, speak with the, uh, um, I always gravitate toward the Marines in the group, but, uh, but I, I, I speak to the men and women and, uh, or, or the, the uh, men, should I say more? And I, I asked them to uh, think, think about when they were in boot camp, right? And it's always a very special day when you get your, your official portrait taken. And, and that's generally done, I don't know, you know, seven, eight, nine weeks uh, be before you, you physically finish boot camp uh, because they, they need time to get the photos together and whatnot. Um, so, so I always ask them to, to, to think about when that occurred and the, the immense pride you had because you know, you were almost done with boot camp. You had maybe one more phase to go, uh, which is probably the, the hardest phase, but you have one more phase to go. And uh, you, you feel an immense pride because you, you know you're going to be part of something for the rest of your life. And, and that, picture, that picture is going to be that graphic representation of, uh, of, of who you are and, and it'll follow you. I, I, I have it hanging um, uh, here in my home and it's always going to be there. So, so I asked them to, to think about that and think about the pride that, that, that you felt when you, you had that picture taken and try to recapture that and take that with you as you transition from a state of incarceration to a state of parole supervision. Um, the uh, second thing I'd like to talk about is, is some of the work we've done um, uh, on the uh, veteran services unit. Um, at the state parole board, we, we, we've been blessed to have uh, uh, really, really great leadership um, over the years and visionary leadership who, who understood the need to uh, uh, work with veterans as they transition from incarceration to a period of uh, community supervision. Um, so what we were able to do is create uh, certain classifications of parole agents, uh, parole agents that are specifically trained to, to deal with um, the, the issues of, of men and women who are transitioning. Uh, on the inside, uh, we call them reentry parole agents where they are assigned directly to the, uh, to the units, whether they were transitional housing units or veteran services unit. And they were in a position to uh, not only work with the individuals and work with the, the, uh, uh, the VSU's team, their, the counselors, the unit managers, the COs, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, treatment folks uh, within the institution to, to give sort of those, those life skills uh, uh, elements that, that individuals need. But they were specifically trained in cognitive behavioral uh, interventions, which allowed, um, which allowed those institutional reentry parole agents to begin to, to take a critical look at, at how people think and to begin to address some of those thinking disorders and some of those antisocial values that uh, so many of our, our uh, uh, population have. And we, we all know the, uh, the issues associated with uh, uh, trauma, especially with our with our veteran populations and the things that we're starting to learn when I was in the Marine Corps, that's, that stuff just wasn't, that stuff just wasn't there. And I don't think any, anybody cared about it too much back in the, back in the early eighties. But, uh, but, but, but the, uh, the more important thing that, that our RPAs do is not only do they provide those cognitive behavioral in interventions, but they also provide a continuity of care. Uh, element as that person transitions from the institution to community supervision. In the field with probation and parole, we have agents and they're called uh, community reentry parole agents. And, and, and they're, they're parole agents that, that are trained as a traditional parole agent, but they don't carry a caseload. They are specifically there to ensure that an individual is um, uh, assessed. They're there to ensure that, that the individual is referred to the right uh, a community uh, uh, intervention with, with our community providers, uh, whether the person may need a, a referral to a alcohol and drug uh, evaluation or whether the person needs to go down to the veteran service office uh, within their uh, individual county. So it's, it's these individuals that sort of, sort of pick up that information that is, that is received from the facility and, and utilize it when the individual uh, begins their period of community supervision and provides that continuity of care. And uh, I think they uh, uh, do a really great job. The, the final thing that, that I'd like to talk about is an initiative that, that I've been working closely with Angela and uh, 
Brandy, of course, and, and Andy, um, where we're, we're working with uh, judges who share problem solving courts. And you all know um, uh, veterans courts are, are one of those problem solving courts. And we're, we're, we're working with them to bring uh, motivational interviewing training to, to the judges. Uh, we were able to reach, I don't know, 15 or 16 judges uh, a couple months ago uh, with my uh, with my basic fundamentals course. And, and, and what motivational interviewing is, is it's a style of communication. Uh, there, there are, you know, three styles of communication, directing, fo uh, following, and guiding. And the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the method that motivational interviewing utilizes is that, is that guiding style of, of, uh, of a communication that, that, that assists an individual to want to change. Uh, many times we see, especially uh, in the pro business, that we can mandate a whole lot. We can put a whole lot of conditions on people. Judges in their courts can issue a whole lot of orders. And uh, do it, doing that may get you compliance, but it's not going to get you change, right? It's not going to, the, the, the only one who, 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 can, who can really change and make that decision to change is, is the person themselves. So, what we were able to do is, uh, is uh, bring some of those motivational interviewing skills uh, to judges who, who chair um, uh, problem solving courts and the uh, veteran courts are, are around the Commonwealth. I, I, I thought it was uh, very well received. I was extremely nervous doing it um, because of, of the, the judges, but a few things came out of that training that, that was very, uh, that, that, that was very uh, uh, interesting to me. And I think one of the things that came out of that training was, there is an absolute need not only to, to understand the core components of motivational interviewing, but to um, uh, practice. And so as, a, as an outgrowth of that training, I was able to set up some, some lunch and learn sessions where, where judges could, could call me and I would interact with judges and we would role play uh, exactly how a judge could utilize some of those core skills of motivational interviewing within their within their court session. Um, the other thing, so, so I, I think what, what that was able to do was provide the judges uh, a very real opportunity to try to practice and try to get good at it because they're certainly not gonna get good at MI uh, after a two day basic course. You have, to, you have to learn it, you have to practice it, you have to understand it uh, and, and it takes some time. It, it is a skill that needs to be developed. And I, I think the, the other thing that, that we learned uh, was that Judges have a very small period of time to um, actually uh, have an intervention. So I, I, I utilized the framework um, that is used by uh, University of Cincinnati in a program that they call effective uh, or, or effective practices in community supervision. It's, it's acronym is called uh, EPICS. And if you'd, you'd like a little more on that, I would direct you to Dr. Latessa, but uh, what it does is, 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 is it allows a judge to sort of be laser focused on what they're doing. And I was able to uh, um, uh, develop some training uh, for, for common police judges with uh, Mr. Mike Clark from the uh, Center for Effective uh, Strategies in uh, Michigan. We were able to develop a curriculum that specifically gave judges some tools that they can use uh, during during the period where the person is in front of them in that very condensed time frame of seven to seven to ten or fifteen minutes, uh, because you know that's not a lot of time to make an intervention. So you really must be focused, and you really must uh, uh, be, be 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 laser laser tuned in to what it is you're trying to do and what it is you're trying to change. And uh, I I think it was very helpful. Uh, so. Those are the, 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 the two things that came out of the training with judges. We're also uh, working uh, to offer more, more uh, motivational interviewing training. I think our, our next session is scheduled for December. Uh, AOPC is again uh, uh, facilitating that for us. And uh, I, I, I encourage you to sign up um, and I look forward to seeing you there. So I think that's, that's plenty uh, uh, for me in terms of uh, uh, what I see is the most challenging aspect, which is the identification um, and uh, some of the uh, uh, things that we have worked on and some of the things we are, are working on. One final thing I'll leave you with um, 
just just a, a little statistic. Um, the overall the overall uh, uh, population of, of the department is about seven percent of, 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 of veterans, and those are the ones we can identify. And then the overall the overall recidivism rate of individuals who complete the veteran services unit is is around 10%. And I think that 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 is a really, really good testament to not only uh, of the good work that they do in, in veteran services unit, but the good work that the parole board does uh, in terms of providing the continuity of care and providing the access to services uh, once they are under community supervision, especially when you compare that with the upwards of 50 and 60% of uh, recidivism rates uh, that we see for uh, uh, individuals uh, returning to prison presently. So great job, VSU. And, and I, I really uh, uh, thank the department for their vision and the parole board for their vision in instituting these uh, uh, veteran services units around the Commonwealth. So um, I entertain questions. And so thank you again. I am indeed privileged to have uh, spoken with you this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Richard and Michael. Uh, and to our attendees, if you have questions, please type them into the, the chat box and we'll have a look there. But I guess um, I, I'll start off by asking, you, you both talked about the continuity of care um, and you talk with you know great care, obviously, uh, and, and attention to detail from the beginning of the veterans in, you know, interaction with the criminal justice system um, up until you know parole and the end of their probation and parole period. I guess the other question I had is, there are also a great number of, a high percentage of your um, correctional officers and parole officers who are also veterans. How can you better tap into those individuals who may also have, as you do, uh, a heightened sense of um, you know, relationship with veteran uh, incarcerated individuals? How do, you, how do you get them to help you in these efforts? Well, I, I, I really believe, um... You know, as an agency, you know, just being brutally honest, I think that we'd all admit in the administration as well that we've kind of missed our mark when it comes to veteran employees. Um, honestly, the, Governor Wolf came out with his recognition, recognition campaign in uh, 2019. And what that did is it provided an uh, avenue for the Office of Administration to really identify the number of veterans for each agency there and under the, under the uh, governor's advisory. And, uh, and what they found specifically to corrections and parole was that the number was overwhelming. We knew it was a heavy number because as an agency, we know we hire a lot of vets. But it's one thing to think, well, we have a lot of vets working here, but then to actually see a number, it kind of puts everything in perspective. And what that did is it showed within our agencies, you know, we have right around 7,000 active employees that are veterans, which is almost half of the agency as a whole. Uh, and I think when that number was exposed, it really was eye-opening and, uh, and, and, just in the short period of time I've had this position, I've talked to several staff members that have reached out and, and several of those, especially the correction officers, have openly admitted that they have somewhat felt slighted because they felt like here's an agency that has since 2015 been opening these veteran service units, giving resources and benefits and bringing in people and workshops for these 26 to 2000, or 2,600 to 3,000 inmates. And yet there's 7,000 staff members that are sitting there Many of them joined as a corrections officer like I did right out of the military who really have no idea what is out there for them, their children, their families. And so um, the administration is really committed to changing that. And, and after all of this has been uh, presented, you know, our administration actually hired five statewide manager positions that are veteran positions. They're the first five veteran positions under the agency. Um, everything that's been done to date for veteran services within the Department of Corrections it has been basically a collateral duty, uh, an additional duty of somebody uh, on the side that is volunteering because they wanna help. Now we have five full-time manager positions. It, how we're gonna help those employees is by working with the VA, DMVA to bring in workshops, resources. The PA Bar Association has talked about their military and veteran committee coming in and maybe doing some pro bono work like wills, powers of attorney, you know, stuff like that that employees, anything is gonna be looked at as a big deal because we, when we're trying so hard to work with the inmates and we have 7,000 veteran staff, if we reach out to them, even an email to them, uh, the OA, um, I'm gonna throw them out there, Corey uh, Ock from the OA, just sent out a statewide email 
uh, to all state employees under governor's jurisdiction that were in the Air Force, which is what he retired from. The Air Force birthday just occurred and he sent it out to the 1600 Air Force members just saying uh, a little uh, recount of what it's like to be in the Air Force, being proud of your service and thanking them for their service. And some of my executive staff forwarded that to me and said, wow, you wouldn't believe the positive reaction that just this email that was sent to staff had on our people. So many people reached out saying, hey, did you get this? Did you get this? And now that's going to be something that they're always going to do for each service on their anniversary. That's just an email. So a lot of times I think agencies or, or leadership loses their mind. Like if I can't give you the world, I might as well not give you anything because if I can't give you something huge, it's not going to be well received. When in fact, it's those little things. Bring a workshop in, bring a bus in and let somebody go out and sit and talk to somebody from the VA about services for their children for 10 minutes and see the impact that it has. So we're going to really focus this next year on not only what we can do for our employees that are veterans, but also how we can bridge the gap between the employees and inmates and work that common denominator of you all serve. We have a thousand reasons that we fight against each other when it comes to inmates and staff members. Maybe we can use this as the strong common bond of saying, hey, we can partner up. We can do these symposiums and workshops and celebrations and honoring our military with the ones in browns and with the ones in grays. And we can actually bridge some of that you know, uh, tension that certainly is there, especially coming out of this pandemic. So we look forward to the opportunity and, and these new managers and I and this collective team moving forward, really look at that challenge about the, the staff component and then bridging that gap between staff and inmate as an exciting opportunity moving into 2022. Right, Mike, and I, I, I would just add to that, there has been uh, uh, an increased focus on employee wellness that we're seeing not only coming out of the OA, but coming out of the department and, and the parole board as well. And, and the more that we're learning about, about trauma and, and brain trauma and the development of the brain in terms of, in, in terms of cognitive functioning and, and how long that takes to, to, to occur, uh, you know, the, the increased emphasis on trauma intervention, not only with uh, uh, the inmate population, but with our our employees as well, our, our, our veterans that uh, 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 work with us have, have, has, has had an increased focus in uh, recent months and, day and, and uh, weeks as well. Thank you. Uh, I guess, could you talk about uh, the difference between how men and women experience their service and, and then very specifically incarceration and how, and, and how the system is dealing with women uh, incarcerated individuals? Who are veterans? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that, um, you know, I had a really great military experience from boot camp. My five years, um, I didn't really experience any, any real conflict. Uh, I got educated when I was in the service. I had a great core group of friends. I had a very technical job, uh, which I never, uh, I, I was, I was on two lists to deploy to Afghanistan and Iraq, but I never actually went because my my job was not required during the times that the deployments left. So I stayed uh, in country, I got educated, I had a good core group of support and I got out. So it was a very great service. During that period of time and even the years before and after, that's not the normal experience and I've come to learn and understand that. Like I'm grateful for my service and I'm proud of my service. But what I've seen in, in, in talking is, it's a whole different look. Uh, for most of the people that that we deal with, especially inside the walls, because often what has led them there is that PTSD and anxiety, TBI or MST, especially with the women's side. Uh, dealing with the women for the, you know, the first time that I went to Muncie and spent several days there and talked to some of the inmates, uh, you know, military sexual trauma is very real and the percentages are very high. You know, just in general, females within correctional walls, rate of abuse, sexual abuse and trauma in their lives is extremely high. You know, I've heard numbers 70, 80, 90%. I don't know where it actually falls and maybe nobody knows because of self-reporting, but it's high. But then you add to the fact of, um, you know, military experience when me and Rich are sitting there talking about that esprit de corps and that pride that you take. Well, a lot of these women had a whole different experience and they don't feel that esprit de corps and they don't feel that pride because, you know, they were in a male dominated environment and many of them were victimized. Uh, many of them, uh, in order to maintain their status or maintain you know, that smile on their face, took that victimization, 
turned their head, acted like it didn't happen, uh, didn't report it, uh, feared reporting it. And then they get out and it's not, they don't get out with that, you know, hat on the back, like, hey, you know, thank you for your service and you can be proud of it. And they're not going to the VFWs and sitting down and having a beer with the people that they serve with. You know, they're sitting there, they're ashamed, they're embarrassed, they're hurt and they're scarred. And now all of a sudden they come into a prison environment where you kind of face a lot of those same obstacles and they don't know how to get themselves out of that. And it takes a special kind of person, uh, inmate or staff member to be able to open up and get them to reveal some of those war wounds, you know, as, as we call them. Um, so um, we have SCI Muncie as our female veteran service unit. And, and, and speaking of those managers that just got hired, you know, what a blessing it was that we had, you know, 24, 25 great candidates put in for that position. But the person who got the position is a female that is a trained military sexual trauma trainer. She served, she had her own experience while she was in, and she really is able to, going to be able to engage and, uh, and grow that uh, population in a positive direction. You know, before somebody can really make positive change, there's got to be an element of healing that takes place. And getting the right people in there that can basically uh, guide them in that healing process and really be a true sign of support uh, because they've been down that road. I mean, it's huge. So um, our women population for veterans that we've identified is small. I'd say less than 40 uh, that we know of within the state uh, confinement. But, you know, that's 40 opportunities to make a positive difference in a life that may have been through a hell that none of us know. So, um, so I think that because of the movement that's been going on in our country as far as empowering men and women, uh, you know, to open up about sexual assault, I think that, that you know, we're seeing that within the prison ranks as well, and, and, and more power to it. Because like I said, you know, every person that we can make a positive change is one less person that's less likely to go out and reoffend, which ultimately is all of our collective goals. Right, right. And I'd, I'd uh, agree with Mike there. It's, it's, it's something that we're, we're uh, learning about. Um, not only are we learning about, about trauma in general, but we're learning about uh, a gender type trauma. And I have to, I have to say, it's something that, that I mean, I'm largely ignorant of. Um, my Marine Corps experience, like I said, uh, you know, early '80s um, artillery. I don't think I saw a woman Marine in six years. Um, it just wasn't part of the existence. Um, so, you know, I, I, I have a hard time relating to um, uh, WMs uh, now, and, and I'm learning more and more about it. And I'm learning because our, our commandant of our Marine Corps League uh, detachment's a, 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 a woman Marine. So it's uh, something that I am learning and, and, and trying to get my head around as well. But it's, uh, it's definitely something we've been largely ignorant of. This morning, you've talked about, you know, even starting with, you know, judges and court staff, all the way through um, parole and um, probation. Can you look even further back and, and suggest or have you identified things that should be done for people who are currently serving or who as they're discharged from service or community engagement prior to their, you know, after their service? Are there things that we should be doing differently for, for military service members and veterans that may keep them out of the criminal justice system? Well, you know, I think one of the big things is, and, and I'm a culprit of this, is, um, you know, some real community awareness or uh, of getting these veterans once they're discharged to go to the VA. Go just meet uh, with somebody, get an appointment. It doesn't matter if you come out with no disability, with a disability, if you have a good job lined up, I'll say I went right from, you know, the military into a state job. I never went to a VA. I never researched any of the benefits for me. I got right into a job that gave me good benefits that took care of me, um, my family. And uh, for 15 years, you know, I've sat here and, and then this job, you know, opened up. I, I got this position as statewide veterans coordinator. And I realized that I really don't know a whole lot about what there is out there available because I've been blessed to be in a good job and I've been blessed with good benefits. Um, in, in, in nine months of holding this position, the amount of information that I've learned through great people in the DMVA, the VA, Vietnam Vets of America, Veterans of Foreign Wars, 
uh, outside resources is that there is so much out there available. And it doesn't matter whether you have a great job or whether you have no job, like just getting that information and having that information is powerful because you never know when a situation is going to arise and all of a sudden you're missing out on one of those elements that are necessary to, you know, live a, live a good life. And if you have the resources available and you know that you have somebody that you can call, obviously the stress and the anxiety of the situation is lowered. And, it, you know, you don't resort to, you know, maybe, you know, grabbing uh, a substance to use. You don't resort to anger and violence because you actually feel like there's an out. You don't feel like you're failing. You're hopeless. You have nowhere to turn. Uh, so I think honestly, like, good community engagement, whether it's, I mean, a lot, most of these military programs have, or military services have delayed entry programs. People sign up and, and, and they also have, you know, when people are coming back to the community, they, um, they have transition classes when you're getting out. I think honestly, the importance of setting up VA appointments uh, once they're getting out would be a huge service uh, to members. And it could be something that's actively going on right now that I'm not aware of, but certainly when I was going out, um, you know, that was not emphasized. And I think that it would be key to our, our discharge veterans. I, I would suggest um, uh, expanding the role of the problem solving courts, uh, especially veteran courts and, 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 and doing what we can to uh, uh, not only expand the role of, of veteran courts and other problem solving courts, but, but really try and understand uh, that linkage uh, between uh, cognitive behavioral development and uh, uh, behavior, understand that, you, you know, veterans have a different perspective. They see the world through a different lens. And I think everyone sees the world through a different lens, but veterans especially. And when you, and when you add to that, possibly the trauma uh, that they may have experienced and uh, while they were in the military and that resulting in, you know, you know, you know, alcohol and drug problems, but possibly even, uh, other types of behavioral problems that we see. So having, having courts and having our, our district attorneys and our public defenders and our, our community people understand and try to see that linkage, uh, I think can enhance the numbers of people going to problem solving courts and, and engaging in that diversionary activity, getting, getting the interventions they need prior to even coming to the prison. Uh, I think that can go a long way. And, and I would also say uh, some more training in in, in uh, what I would call the evidence-based practices or the science of what works to effectuate offender change, to, to, to change the way people think and change the way people behave. Uh, there are many, many different types of evidence-based practices in community supervision that I've been teaching for years that I've embraced and I'm very passionate about. Motivational interviewing is just one of them. And, you know, MI was something that we have found uh, was just something that Many of the judges were just not exposed, not ever exposed to it in any of their legal training, any of the any of the way uh, how they communicate uh, with uh, defendants and, and 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 their clients. And I think understanding understanding the process of change uh, and how it relates to the veteran population uh, can go a long way. So, there's a question from an audience member about: Are there ways to volunteer uh, with inmates or the correctional system outside of the pro bono council role? I, I, um, I would, go ahead, Rich. I, I, I would just say that, that if, if, uh, if you'd like to volunteer, one way to volunteer is, is being a problem solving or a veterans court mentor. If, if you have a, a veteran uh, who can serve as a mentor, uh, that, that can, you know, we, we have learned that trained mentors uh, with veteran courts really, really are helpful. Um, to the individuals who are involved. And there are, there are ways that veterans can communicate with one another. Uh, you know, I've walked a mile in your boots. I, I understand what it is you're going through. Uh, I'm here to help you. So that's one way to volunteer. Yeah, I would say, you know, within the walls, it's obviously pretty hard, you know, as far as, you know, volunteer opportunities. Um, you know, the, the one thing I think, you know, you, you might be able to be done are like, you know, letters of support that could be sent, um, you know, either to myself, you know, that, that could be read or taken to these units uh, just as a, um, hey, you know, 
former vet, not a former vet, but, you know, we appreciate your service, you know, like, you know, there's opportunities for change. I mean, they like, honestly, inside the, bringing anything from the outside inside the walls is refreshing for this population. The people they see in there every day, the faces they see in there every day uh, can be the most positive, impactful, caring, professional faces. But uh, you bring in a speaker from outside, you bring in paperwork from outside, you bring in a newsletter from outside and they love it. You know, so, I mean, if there's articles, if there's, you know, things that inspire hope, uh, that inspire change, uh, then, then certainly, you know, any of that information could be sent to, you know, veteran leadership and, and, and shown or taken to those inmate populations and presented and, and, and certainly be used as a, as a positive, positive motivating factor for them. With just a few minutes to go, I want to ask what I hope is a quick question of our two panelists. You know, in government, so many things come down to expense. How do the programs that you're talking about today and the services that you're talking about today, are they more expensive than not doing them? What's the impact on the budget of correction? Um, I, I would say the impact is pretty minimal. Uh, there, there are some... Um, for, for any specialized unit across the state, there are some expenses that are going to be requested and budgeted. But as far as like what we're doing, the main expense, honestly, is 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 the employee. You know, these new positions that got put in, that's the expense. Uh, that was a huge commitment by administration saying, you know what, you know, we've been kind of kicking around this program for five or six years because we believe in it, but we've never really put uh, you know, our money where our, our mouth is and, and where the pride is of these programs and saying, all right, we're going to take these five people that are running a program, but only a quarter of their time is spent on it. And we're going to put somebody in there that can devote all of their time and passion to the service uninterrupted because we want to see where it can go. Because Pennsylvania has been a national leader of change in the field of corrections and parole for a long time. Um, and so what we don't want to do is, you know, we had the National Corrections Institute come in and do a great article about our veterans program a few years ago, because it, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, where we were headed, you know, was a great position. Things kind of got, you know, all over the place the last few years. But what we don't want to do is see that great program dismantle. So it very easily could. And with change in administration and with all of the focus on COVID, Nobody would have faulted the Department of Corrections and PA for just saying, hey, veterans got to wait. We got to focus over here. And that program just disbanded. But what they did is say, we are dealing with COVID. We are you know, behind in our budget, but this is so important to us. We're going to hire five manager level positions to show that we are committed to this cause. So I think that's where your great expense is. And we couldn't be, um, you know, we couldn't be better off as far as my position with the leadership that we currently have within the agency right now. Right, right, Mike, and I, I would certainly, I would certainly uh, uh, echo that those, those remarks. The, uh, the, the department and the board have made a commitment to do it, and we certainly don't have a shortage of inmates. We have enough, we have enough veteran inmates to, to, to fill cell blocks. So it's certainly not that issue, um, uh, and we have um, good leadership that is committed to it, and we have staff available and staff who want to do this work. People like yourself, Mike. I mean, people want to do this work and work with the veteran population. So, I mean, you, you know, we, we've been fortunate to have, have inspired le leadership at the department and the board. So, And just real quick to follow up on that, when, when Rich talks about the people that want to affect change, um, when I first got into this position, one of the first things I wanted to do was just build a contact list to at least get one contact at every one of our 25 facilities that I could turn to and provide information to, to get out to the inmate, the veteran population. I was hoping for at least one from every jail. So I sent out a notice to the facility administration saying, listen, can you guys each get me one person that I can use as a point of contact? And from the 25 institutions, I have a, you know, within a, a month, I had a contact list of like 170 people. I mean, hands were raised all over the place. There are so many people that just said, I don't care what you want me to do. Like, I just want to be a part of it. I want to help. You know, and these are staff members. And, and like I said, when you talk about that divide between staff and inmate, you would think, well, how many hands are really going to raise? You know, like who wants to help the people that are, you know, like involved in fights or gangs or inmate? But you know what? It's there. I mean, I mean, the, the desire is there. It's just we really needed to get better collaboration, more effective communication, get on the same page, get a vision that we can all work toward and then head down that path together. And that's what we're doing. 
Well, I know that all of our attendees will join me in thanking both Michael Carrington and Richard Pajewski for their really valuable comments and uh, sharing their experience and expertise with us this morning. I will turn it back over to Professor Johnson to close out the program. And I thank you uh, for having me as your moderator this morning. Thank you, Corinna and our participants. I've, um, I've always wanted to listen to what was going on with respect to parole and prison with our, our veterans who served so well, but then found themselves in, in difficulty and problems. I think we are really well served today. So thank you everybody. A reminder that we'll be having the, the next panel, which will be next Friday again at nine o'clock. Again, we'll be focusing on, for this panel, we'll be talking about equity, diversity, and inclusion with respect to ensuring justice for veterans. So thanks everyone. And we look forward to seeing you next Friday. You're welcome.